Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation titled, Development of Rational Immunotherapy Combinations to Overcome the Immunosuppressive Prostate Tumor Microenvironment. We are delighted to bring you this seminar presented by LabRoots. My name is Susie Valdez, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Sumit Subudi, as an assistant professor in the Jenny Tour Urinary Medical Oncology Program at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab on the top of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, we encourage you to submit it in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address those questions following his presentation. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits if you would like to earn an education and free continuing education credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Sumit Sabuti. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Susie and LabRoots for uh, inviting me to speak today and also to all the people who have tuned in so early in the morning, especially those in the uh, West Coast. And so, as Susie said, I'll be talking about the immunosuppressive prostate tumor microenvironment. Here are my disclosures. I wanna point out that I will be discussing non-FDA approved indications during this presentation. So why immunotherapy? It's because the immune system can actually kill tumor cells. What you see on the left is a tumor cell surrounded by four T cells. These T cells will serially attack the cancer so that it eventually eradicates it that's shown in the right. And the T cells do this by taking advantage of three specific properties, adaptability, specificity, and memory. This is important because, especially the memory, because this leads to durable or even curative responses. And I'll, pe I'll keep coming back to this term, durable uh, responses, in future slides. So tumor microenvironment is quite complex. This is a simplification of the immune portion of the tumor microenvironment. And what you see in the center here is the tumor cell, surrounded by a lot of immune cells on the left and on the right. The key point of this figure is that not all immune cells are good. The ones on the right are the ones that help the tumor grow, and they're considered immunosuppressive immune cells. And the ones on the left help kill the cancer, and these are called immunostimulatory cells. Examples of the ones on the right that are immunosuppressive and help the cancer grow are immature dendritic cells, macrophages, especially the M2 phenotype, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, Th2 cells, as well as regulatory T cells. And, they, and a lot of the cytokines associated with them are IL-6 or interleukin-6, interleukin-4, TGF-beta. Now, for the immunostimulatory, which is on the left, examples include mature dendritic cells, CDA T cells or cytotoxic T cells, natural killer cells, and um, CD4 T cells and cytokines associated with them are interleukin-2, interleukin-12, and interferon gamma. Now, one of the points of immunotherapies is to switch the balance here within the immune tumor microenvironment. We want less of the immunosuppressive cells and more of the immunostimulatory cells. So immunotherapies, they come in many flavors. I'm just gonna speak about a few of them that are in clinic now that have received FDA approval. So vaccines, these are therapies that direct the immune system to attack and recognize a particular protein on the cancer cell itself. And those proteins are called tumor antigens. Then you have cellular therapies, there's many examples, but CAR T cells is one of the hottest ones. And here you have the, uh, the CAR T cells are engineered to directly 
recognize the cancer cells. And then finally, you have immune checkpoint therapies that, um, or otherwise known as immune checkpoint blockade. And this actually removes the breaks from the T cells, increases T cell activation and function. And one of the main points here is that not all immunotherapies are the same, as you can see that I've given you three different examples with different mechanisms of action but they also have different side effect profiles or toxicity profiles. For example, vaccines are well known to cause infusion-related reactions as well as flu-like symptoms. CAR T cells are known for their cyto uh, cytokine release syndrome or CRS. And immune checkpoint therapies are known for immune-related adverse events, example, uh, or that are characterized by inflammation of various organ sites. And these, this can be like uh, similar to an autoimmune phenomenon. Now, before I f uh, go on about immune checkpoint therapies, I think it's, it's a good time to go back and really understand how T cells are regulated. I'm gonna go over two decades of work by Jim Allison in this one slide. And so Jim Allison in the early 1980s discovered the T cell receptor or TCR, and that's expressed on the T cell, and it recognizes the foreign proteins on another cell. And in this case, it's recognizing a tumor antigen or a protein expressed on the tumor cells. And that tumor antigen is in the form of a peptide that's complex with major histocompatibility complex or MHC. And the engagement of the T cell receptor with the tumor antigen causes the T cell to get stimulated and it's, a, and it's what we call signal one. But signal one alone does not cause T cells to proliferate. The analogy that I would like to use is what we do um, when we start the car. We put the key into the car ignition and turn the ignition. That would be signal one. But as you know, the car does not move. You hear the motor, but the car does not move. In order to get the car to move, you have to press or put your right foot on the gas pedal. And so when you do that, the car moves. Jim Allison understood this, and so he searched for the second signal, and he found it in the mid-1980s, and that the best characterized co-stimulatory signal is CD28, or signal two. And CD28 is constitutively expressed on T cells, and it binds to its ligands B71 or B72. They're also known as CD80 and CD86, and they're expressed on professional antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Now, a key point here is signal two alone is insufficient to get T cells to proliferate, and signal one alone is insufficient to get T cells to proliferate. Similar to our car analogy, without a key and you put your gas on the gas pedal, the car will not move. And without the, and so you need both the car key and the ignition as well as the right foot on the gas pedal to get things to move. But the problem is as the car is moving, at some point you're gonna have to hit, you need a brake. And Jim Allison understood this. And in 1994, him and Jeffrey Bluestone independently discovered the brake CTLA-4. Now, break, the break is crucial, because think about this. Many of us, when we get sick, what we do, or we have a cough symptoms, we start feeling around our throat because we're feeling for the lymph nodes that are inflamed because the T cells are fighting the infection. Now, if there was no break, the T cells would continue proliferating, and eventually we would die from a lymphoproliferative disorder. And that's actually what happens in mice that lack CTLA-4, or the break. They die from a lymphoproliferative disorder within two to three weeks of being born. Jim Allison then developed a drug that blocks the function of CTLA-4 temporarily. And so it releases the breaks and allows the T cells to uh, be functional again. And so he used this in a mouse model of cancer. And you can see that in the control group, the, the, without any treatment, the tumors just grow. And so on the y-axis is average tumor size, on the x-axis is days after tumor injection. 
In the bottom left, you'll see three arrows, and those are the three uh, three time points in which anti-CTLA-4 was administered in the mice. And you can see that in the mice that received anti-CTLA-4, there was great reduction in uh, tumor growth rates. Furthermore, you see that the tumors actually initially grew, but then shrunk. And this is a phenomenon that we call pseudoprogression. And this is seen in approximately 10 to 15% of our patients. Here's an example of a patient who was actually one of the earliest patients treated with ipilimumab. And this is a patient with melanoma. So this patient unfortunately had exhausted all other therapies and was told his only choices were a clinical trial versus hospice care. After receiving one dose of ipilimumab, you can see his cancer significantly increased. On the left, you can see it visually, and on the right, you can see a CAT scan representing the, the cancer. The patient was told that he had progressed and would need to go into hospice care. But while in hospice care, you see that the cancer actually shrunk and eventually disappears. So this is an example of pseudoprogression, and that's seen again in approximately 10 to 15% of our patients treated with ipilimumab. So what's actually going here? Why does it actually increase in size? So if you took a, a needle and biopsied at week 12 the, the cancer, what you'd see is you'd see an influx of T cells and other inflammatory cells, and probably also uh, tumor necrosis going on there. So it gives the appearance as if the tumor is growing when it actually is uh, going through inflammation and dying. So this is a landmark study that uh, led to the FDA approval of ipilimumab or anti ctla 4 in metastatic melanoma. On the y-axis is overall survival. On the x-axis is time in months. And the ipilimumab was compared to the control group is a GP100 vaccine. And you can see there are two ipilimumab groups, one with ipilimumab monotherapy in red, and a second one, ipilimumab plus GP100 vaccine in blue. Both arms actually improve median overall survival. But the other interesting thing that was surprising is that there's a tail at the end of the curve. And that tail suggests that there's durable responses here. In fact, a retrospective analysis of patients treated with ipilimumab shows that this tail develops around three years at 36 months and can go on to approximately 10 years. We believe this represents durable responses and even curative ones. So this sort of changes how we think about standard drug development. Initially, we always thought about it, is the drug improving survival? Is it causing the curve to shift to the right from the purple to the blue bar? But now with immunotherapy, such as ipilimumab, we're not just asking the curve to shift to the right, we're also asking to raise the tail. Because you can see in the purple and blue bars, with eventual time, all the patients will succumb, succumb to the cancer and pass away. But with the immunotherapy anti ctla 4 with the tail raised, these are durable or even curative responses that we're seeing. So these studies uh, led Science Magazine to consider cancer immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year in 2013. And since the discovery of CTLA-4 as an immune checkpoint or a break on T cells, two other breaks were discovered, PD-1 and PDL one and, and many others. But these three have cons are the ones that have been targeted by pharmaceutical companies and led to the FDA approval in multiple cancers listed here in blue. And underneath and bulleted under these cancers are all the drugs that target one of these three immune checkpoints, CTLA-4, PD-1, and PDL one This led the Nobel Committee to award the Nobel Prize in 2018 to Jim Allison for his work on CTLA-4 and to Suko Hanjo for his work with PD-1. 
So although targeting the brakes CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibit or, uh, sorry, targeting releases the brakes off the T cells, they actually work mechanistically in different ways. And I want to point them out here. So anti-CTLA-4 functions more with signal 2 or the co-stimulatory pathway CD28, whereas anti-PD-1 works more in signal 1, which targets the T cell receptor pathway. Anti-CTLA-4 works on T cell priming. So that's the initiation of a T cell response from it recognizing antigen for the first time. Whereas anti-PD-1 tends to work more in the effector phase or within the tumor microenvironment cells where the T cells are exhausted. Because it works in priming, anti-CTLA-4 also expands clonal diversity, which anti-PD-1 does not. Anti-CTLA-4 works primarily on CD4 T cells whereas anti-P1 primarily on CD8 T cells. I'll show you examples of this later, but anti ct 4 can convert a cold tumor. A cold tumor is one that has few T cells in it, and it can convert it into a hot tumor by moving more T cells in, which anti-PD1 cannot do. And because anti ct 4 tends to work in the beginning of a T cell response, it its responses clinically are often slower as opposed to the rapid responses you can see with anti-PD-1 because it's working at the level of the tumor microenvironment. There are more toxicities seen with anti-CTLA-4 and disease recurrence after a response is rarer. So you see more durable type responses with anti-CTLA-4 than you do with anti-PD-1. So here's an example of a melanoma patient treated with an anti-PD-1 or PDL one agent. And so you can see the melanoma itself on the patient, but right above it, you see the tumor microenvironment and it's characterized with CD8 immunohistochemistry. There's a red line there as well. And that above the red line represents the, the tumor margin and below it is where the tumor exact, uh, exists. And you see a lot of CD8 T cells uh, right at the tumor margin and a few CD8 T cells within the tumor itself. And this would be considered an immunologically hot tumor. And when you treat with anti-PD-1 or PDL one you see an influx or an increase in CD8 uh, T cells right into the tumor. And that's associated with improved clinical outcomes of the patient's melanoma. Now, in a separate uh, study, they looked at kidney cancer patients. And here's an example of a patient where they're looking at transcriptional levels of genes associated with T cell activation or T cell effector functions. And following treatment with anti PD1 or PDL1, you can see an increase in these gene expression levels. Now, here's an example of a cold melanoma tumor, which has few CD8 T cells. And following treatment with anti PD1 or PDL1, you see that there is no influx of CD8 T cells. So it's unable to convert this cold tumor into a hot one. And as a result, you can see the melanoma progresses or gets bigger in this patient. And here's an example of a transcriptional profile of a woman with breast cancer, which also considered an immunologically cold tumor. And you can see following treatment of anti PD1 or PDL1, none of the genes associated with T cell activation or effector function have increased. So, do immune checkpoint therapies work in prostate cancer? This was one of the first studies. It was a phase one study looking at nivolumab or anti PD1 in, a, in a multiple different malignancies. And that 17 patients in this study had prostate cancer and there were no objective responses, meaning no partial responses or clinical responses seen radiographically. More recently, a number of patients with uh, metastatic prostate cancer were evaluated who were treated with pembrolizumab, another anti-PD-1 agent. And you can see the response rates were ranging from three to 6% of patients who actually uh, received um, that had a partial response or a complete response. But in this bar graph here, which represents, each bar represents an individual patient, you see that a subset of patients actually did have some durable responses. 
So overall, it's a low response rate, but the few that do respond tend to have durable responses. Anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab has also been tested in prostate cancer in two phase three studies. Here's the first one. It's in the pre-chemotherapy setting. And here, ipilimumab was directly compared to placebo. And you can see there's an improvement in progression-free survival. It was also tested in the post-chemotherapy setting in a phase three study. And here, ipilimumab was also compared to placebo, but both the ipilimumab group and the placebo group received radiation therapy to up to three bone metastatic fields. So this is ipilimumab plus radiation therapy versus placebo plus radiation therapy. And again, you see increased progression-free survival, suggesting that there is activity of ipilimumab. However, when we look at overall survival in both the pre-chemotherapy and the post-chemotherapy groups, there fails to be an overall survival benefit. The one thing that I do want to point out, and it's ob more obvious in the post-chemotherapy group, that there is a tail at the end of the curve. If you look at the red line, there is a tail there. An updated analysis, uh, speaking uh, with personal communication with the, the authors of this um, trial, state that there's still a tail five to seven years out. So this is uh, something where we're seeing that the, as an overall survival, it doesn't help uh, patients with prostate cancer, but there are a subset that benefit. So one of the questions our group had is, can we identify these patients who benefit and can we use immunological biomarkers to identify them? So in order to do that, we developed an investigator-initiated trial with 30 patients. All the patients had metastatic prostate cancer. And we asked the patients to have their primary prostate or their metastatic prostate either biopsied or resected so that we had sufficient tissue for whole exome sequencing and, and RNA sequencing so that we could identify potential tumor mutations. At that point, the patients were able to receive four doses of ipilimumab at three milligrams per kilogram, which is the FDA-approved dose. And we collected peripheral blood at each of these time points. Here are the clinical outcomes of the patients, looking at progression-free survival in months on the y-axis versus overall survival in months in the x-axis. By doing this, we were able to stratify our patients into three groups. You notice the group in green has prolonged progression-free survival and prolonged overall survival. And the group in purple has a very short progression-free survival of less than six months and a short overall survival of less than 12 months. And so these are the two groups. And I also want to point out that many of the patients in the uh, green group, which we, which we call the favorable group, are still alive today. For our biomarker analysis, we actually compared the green group, which is the favorable group, versus the purple group, the unfavorable group. We looked at tumor mutational burden uh, at, across uh, disease sites, so looking at primary prostate versus the metastatic lymph node and other sites metastasis. And we used the frequency of non-synonymous mutations as a measure of tumor mutational burden. In this cohort of 30 patients, the median frequency of non-synonymous mutations was 76. This is in stark contrast to the median that's been observed and published for metastatic melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, where the median is 200. Both metastatic melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer are known to be highly immunoresponsive and tend to respond well to immune checkpoint therapies. So you can see on the um, graph to left that there's no difference in tumor mutational burden between primary and metastatic sites. And surprisingly, there was no difference between the patients who had favorable responses versus unfavorable responses. I say surprisingly because in melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, higher tum tumor mutational burden is associated with higher response rates to immune checkpoint therapies. 
we looked at peripheral T cell responses to tumor associated antigens, such as prostatic specific membrane antigen or PSMA. And we're using an ELI spot assay here where we're counting the number of T cells producing interferon gamma, a TH1 cytokine. And you can see at baseline, there's very few ELI spot uh, T cells or T cells producing interferon gamma, but after four doses, you can see a significant increase. And that's also seen with the tumor-associated antigen prostatic acid phosphatase, or PAP. I want to point out, if you look very closely, you can see the, the uh, post ipilimumab dose number four time point is 38 weeks after that dose. So these are durable peripheral T cell responses we're seeing. Here's example, patient number seven, who has a low tumor mutational burden. You can see the number of non-synonymous mutations in this patient is 13. Remember, the median for this group is 76, and the median for melanoma and lung cancer is approximately 200. So here's a patient with low tumor mutational burden. When we use the RNA-seq data to see how many of these mutations were expressed, eight were expressed, and then we used an ELI spot analysis to detect potential new antigens. In example of one, this is rho guanine nucleotide exchange factor 37, where the arginine is substituted for tryptophan. On the left, you see the raw ELI spot data with the wild type protein. You see very few T cells responding to that wild type protein. But in the mut with the mutant protein, you can see a lot of T cells producing interferon gamma. This is graphically represented in the blue bar graph. And you can see at baseline, the new antigen is response is virtually undetectable. But after four doses of ipilimumab, you see a significant enhancement. Now, to determine whether or not CD8 T cells or CD4 T cells are responsible, responsible for this response, we depleted either CD4 cells or CD8 cells. And when we deplete CD4 T cells, we don't see a significant difference in, in um, the number of LE spot T cells. But when we deplete CD8 T cells, you can see a significant decrease, suggesting that this is a class one restricted, I mean, see class one restricted neoantigen. We also had pretreatment tissue in which we did RNA sequencing and we did gene set enrichment analysis and found that the interferon gamma response signature was upregulated in the favorable cohort as opposed to the unfavorable cohort. In addition, we used uh, T cell sig or sorry, immune signatures looking at various immune subpopulations within the tumor microenvironment transcriptionally and found that cytotoxic T cells and memory T cell signatures were upregulated in the favorable versus unfavorable cohort. This is all consistent with the fact that having more T cells that have a Th1 phenotype or interferon gamma and effector phenotype are associated with favorable outcomes. And we confirmed this at the protein level, looking by immunohistochemistry, and you'll see that there's more CD8 T cells in the favorable group, and right next to the CD8, IHC is also ranzyme B, that uh, is a marker of T cell cytolytic activity. So inclusion for this part of the talk, Low tumor, uh, tumor mutational burden tumors such as prostate cancer can have high density of T effector cells or interferon gamma signature within the tumor microenvironment. It's unclear whether these can be used as a biomarker to select for patients who are most likely to benefit from immune checkpoint therapies, but we are currently trying to validate this in a larger cohort of patients on an international clinical trial. In addition, we found that you can actually detect tumor neoantigens in patients with low tumor mutational burden, and we're able to confirm this in an in silico algorithm. And that's important because that means we can actually develop personalized new antigen vaccines for patients using an in silico algorithm. And finally, we showed in that ipilimumab enhanced systemic antigen-specific T cell responses to not only tumor-associated antigens, but also to cancer neoantigens. 
So what prevents anti-CD4 from being more effective in prostate cancer? Uh, and as I showed you earlier, it did not uh, lead to an overall survival benefit in two large phase three studies. To answer this question, we looked at pre and post treatment tissue by immunohistochemistry. And you can see in the pre-treatment tissue, prostate cancer is immunologically cold with very few CD4 and CD8 T cells present by immunohistochemistry. But following treatment with two doses of ipilimumab, you can see a significant infiltration of T cells. So here's an example where ipilimumab converts a cold tumor into a hot tumor. And these T cells are actually activated as they express ICOS. They have a memory phenotype as they express CD45RO, and they have cytolytic activity as they express granzyme B. So these T cells have a license to kill, but something's preventing it from killing it. Because if you look closely, you'll see that there's still adenocarcinoma of the prostate still present in this tumor microenvironment. Mm -hmm. To determine what's preventing the T cells from killing, we looked at matched pre and post treatment tissue at differentially expressed genes and found 650 genes were uh, differentially regulated following treatment with ipilimumab. And of these genes, 41 were what we considered immune-related genes. We focused in on known immune checkpoints. And what we found was at the transcriptional level, both PDL1 and VISTA were upregulated in the post-treatment tissue. We confirmed this by immunohistochemistry, where you can see PDL1 expression both on immune cells as well as the tumor cells. And you can see VISTA expression on the immune cells itself. We then use multiplex immunofluorescence to understand which immune cells are actually expressing PDL1 and to also determine who's expressing more, the tumor cells itself or the immune cells. So you can see aqua represents the tumor cells, PDL1 represented by white color, CD4 in green, CD8 in red and CD68 denoting a macrophage population or a myeloid population um, is in yellow. And here's a graphical representation showing that following treatment with ipilimumab, you see an upregulation on CD8 T cells and CD68 macrophages, as well as on the tumor epithelial cells, where you see very little upregulation on CD4 T cells. And you can see that the the, the frequency is equal between the CD8 T cells, CD68 macrophages, and the tumor cells. We also looked at VISTA expression on and PDL1 expression on the CD68 macrophages. And here again, we use multiplex immunofluorescence. And what we identified was three different populations macrophages that express PDL1 alone, macrophages that express VISTA alone in yellow. Sorry, uh, in white, VISTA is in white, PDL1 is in purple, and CD68 again is in yellow. And then we also found macrophages that express both VISTA and PDL1. And that's graphically shown here on the right side. And what you see is that there are very few macrophages that express both VISTA and PDL1, suggesting their, their expression pattern is mutually exclusive. And maybe there's different ways in which they function as immune checkpoints and in inhibiting T cell responses. But you can see that all three populations are upregulated following treatment with ipilimumab. So we did an ex vivo T cell uh, analysis looking at interferon gamma production when T cells exposed to mitogen like anti-CD3. And you can see there's a significant upregulation of interferon gamma but in the presence of the immune checkpoint PDL1, there's a slight reduction in the interferon gamma production. In the presence of VISTA inhibition, there's a significant uh, reduction in interferon gamma. And when you inhibit both VISTA and PDL1 function, or, or when, you, uh, when you inhibit T cells with uh, VISTA and PDL1, you see an additive effect in reduction of interferon gamma. And this also holds true for another Th1 cytokine tumor necrosis uh, factor, al uh, factor alpha. 
So the, the data here suggests that Vista and PDL1 function to inhibit T cell uh, using different mechanisms. We then looked at what happens in patients treated with ipilimumab in prostate cancer versus melanoma in the context of these PDL1 expressing macrophages. And we can see that ipilimumab in red enhances the frequency of these macrophages more so in prostate cancer than it does in melanoma. And the same holds true for Vista expressing macrophages. It seems to increase more in prostate cancer than in melanoma. We then did some transcriptional analysis and found that the, the, uh, that these macrophages actually are M2 phenotype. They don't express a lot of INOS, they express a lot of arginase. So they're quite immunosuppressive. We then turned to a mouse model of prostate cancer and targeted both uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 and found that when you target both in a murine model of prostate cancer, you improve survival as opposed to monotherapies alone. So this, the, this part of the talk, the conclusion is ipilimumab can upregulate immune checkpoints PDL1 and Vista in the two. to work, uh, appear to work in different mechanisms. They are definitely expressed on macrophages to, and, and these are on M2 type macrophages to suppress T cell functions. And then finally, targeting both the CTLA-4 and PD-1 checkpoints improved outcomes in a preclinical model of prostate cancer. The question is, does it help in patients? So to answer that question, we led and we designed a multi-center international trial with 90 patients with prostate cancer. And they were divided into two cohorts of patients. Cohort one was a pre-chemotherapy cohort and cohort two is a post-chemotherapy cohort. And patients were treated with a combination of nivolumab, which is anti-PD-1, plus ipilimumab, anti-C24, using the FDA-approved dosing regimen for metastatic melanoma. Here we see, and I'm just focusing on, on the details with the red, uh, uh, red uh, rectangular uh, highlights showing that most patients, whether it was a pre-chemotherapy cohort or post-chemotherapy cohort, did not receive all four doses of the combination. And the major reason for that, if you look below, is because 50%, approximately 50% in, in the pre-chemotherapy cohort and 44% in the post-chemotherapy cohort actually had to discontinue due to drug toxicity. So there was a safety issue with this combination. But despite having these safety issues where patients didn't receive all four doses of the combination, you, we saw dramatic clinical responses in a subset of patients in approximately 25% in pre-chemotherapy cohort and approximately 10% in the post-chemotherapy cohort. These are partial responses and complete responses, so a total of 11 patients out of the 62 who had measurable disease. Now I'm gonna show you in the next slide each of these 11 patients. Each bar represents one of these 11 patients. And you can see that on the x-axis, we have time and months. So, so you can see that many of these responses are durable in nature. In fact, two of these patients are ones that I treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And this data lock happened a year and a half ago. And these two patients are still doing well with undetectable PSA and scan showing no evidence of disease, and they have been off any other treatments. And these are patients who had a life expectancy of less than six to 12 months and are now living a full life without cancer. We looked at biomarkers associated with, uh, with these durable responses. And if you can see on the left, we looked at PDL1 expression in the tumor versus homologous recombination defects or DNA damage repair defects. 
And and with PDL1 status or HRD or DDR, we did not see any associations with durable responses. But when we looked at tumor mutational burden, in this case, we were able to see uh, something that was associated, which I'll show you in the next slide. We divide the patients into high tumor mutational burden versus low tumor mutational burden. In this cohort of patients, the median tumor mutational burden was 74.5 based on the number of non-synonymous mutations. And so this is very similar to what I said before in the other clinical trial where the median was 76. And so the high tumor mutational burden are patients who had greater than the median and low is less than the median. And so when you look at progression-free survival on the y-axis versus time and months on the x-axis, you can see patients with a high tumor mutational burden were associated with improved outcomes. And again, this is consistent with what we see in metastatic melanoma as well as non-small cell lung cancer. Here's the raw data for each of the 11 patients who experienced a partial response, a complete response. And on the right column, you see tumor mutational burden. And you can see in blue, the number 20, that is the patient with a low tumor mutational burden. And all the red ones show the ones with relatively high tumor mutational burden. I highlight or circle the ones in, uh, with the black circle because if these patients with prostate cancer actually had melanoma or lung cancer, they would be considered low tumor mutational burden because the median there is greater than or equal to 200. As I mentioned, there were some safety issues that we had to consider, but because of the efficacy that we saw, we expanded the, the phase two study to include approximately 315 patients into four arms. Arm one is, or arm D1 and arm D2 are looking at different dosing and scheduling of the nivolumab plus ipilimumab, ARMD1 using the renal cell dosing, ARMD2 using the non-small cell lung cancer dosing. Both have shown to be less toxic than the melanoma dosing. ARMD3 is ipilimumab monotherapy, and ARMD4 is the uh, escabazitaxel chemotherapy. So in conclusion, we find that targeting both CT4 and PD-1 appears to uh, improve clinical outcomes in a subset of patients. Whether or not this is associated with high median tumor mutational burden needs to be determined in a larger cohort of patients. We were exploring different dosing and scheduling uh, regimens to try to mitigate the toxicities and maximize on the efficacy. But clearly just targeting these two immune checkpoints is not the answer because there appears to be other primary and adaptive resistant mechanisms contributing to why a greater uh, subset of patients are not responding to this uh, approach. We've also uh, embarked on a collaboration with the Parker Institute of Cancer Immunotherapy to see if we can use the combination of targeting anti-PD-1 and anti ct 4 with radiation therapy, with the hopes that radiation therapy will elicit more new antigens that uh, can be recognized by, by the T cells. And then while we're giving this regimen, we will develop a neoantigen vaccine, which will take us approximately 12 weeks. And once the vaccine is de developed for each patient, because it's a personalized vaccine, it will then be added to this regimen. So now I'm gonna turn to the last part of the talk. What about the immunosuppressive prostate tumor microenvironment? So this is a meta-analysis done by Susan Halby. And what she shows here, looking at approximately 10,000 patients with prostate cancer, that you can see the frequency of the distribution of the disease. Approximately 70 to 80% of patients have bone metastases, either bone alone or bone plus lymph node. And this is associated with poor survival compared to the lymph node only disease. We looked within the bone tumor microenvironment and we found that there are very few CD3 T cells inside the bone tumor microenvironment, and that's graphically shown on the right. And each symbol represents an individual patient. In blue, you see the normal bone marrow having a high CD3 density, and in red, you see very few uh, T cells within the bone metastases. 
We also confirmed this in a mewing model of prostate cancer to the bone. The red bar shows you the tumor margin. So the tumor is actually located beneath the red bar, and you can see very few T cells uh, present there. So this recapitulates what we see in our patients, and you can see the graphical representation to the right with um, each symbol representing an individual mouse. We then turned to our patients' data and looked at transcriptional uh, upregulation of the TH1 phenotype following treatment with ipilimumab, and we found that after giving ipilimumab in the primary prostate tissue, you do see an increase in the TH1 T cells. However, you fail to see this in the prostate bone metastatic sites, and the TH1 phenotype is critical for anti-tumor, Im, Im, anti-tumor immunity that's regulated by immune checkpoint therapies. We then turned to our mouse model and found when we looked at the subcutaneous tumor, again, we can see this TH1 upregulation with immune checkpoint therapy, but we failed to see this in the bone tumor microenvironment. In our mouse model, we're able to use each individual mouse as its individual control. So you can see that on the right tumor, so the right um, bone has tumor, whereas the left bone is tumor free. And we can measure multiple cytokines uh, from this tumor microenvironment. And we found that there were elevated TGF beta 1 levels in the tumor bearing bones. And this is consistent with what we see in our patients. So those with osseous or bone metastases have higher levels of TGF beta 1. We went back to our mouse model and we targeted both CTA4 and TGF beta and compared it to monotherapies and found that if you look at week one, there's no difference in, um, in tumor growth. But in week two, targeting both CTA4 and TGF beta reduced tumor growth rates and the same holds for week three. We looked at TH1 responses and found that only the combination of targeting CTA4 and TGF beta um, increases the TH1 response, whereas the monotherapies don't. And this is associated with improved survival. So immune checkpoint therapies have limited efficacy as monotherapies in patients with prostate cancer, especially those with bone bone metastases. And it appears that targeting both CTA4 and TGF beta can improve outcomes in our murine models of prostate cancer. And this needs to now be validated in a clinical trial. And this is a, uh, a clinical trial that we're in negotiations with pharmaceutical companies in developing to confirm our preclinical findings. So the immunosuppressive prostate tumor microenvironment is characterized by few T cells and enrichment of immunosuppressive myeloid cells, as well as presence of immunosuppressive cytokines. So moving forward, we need to develop rational sequential combinatorial strategies to increase T cell infiltration, deal with immune checkpoints that can be an adaptive resistance, modulate the immunosuppressive cells, but there's other factors that I didn't get a chance to explain today, such as metabolism, hypoxia, microbiome, and epigenetics. All of these factors are being evaluated in various clinical trials with immune checkpoint th- therapies. And then finally, we need to improve patient selection. Because of time, I'm just going to skip over the last two slides and go right to acknowledgments. I'd like to thank our patients, uh, first and foremost, for their courage to go on these studies. Not only do they take the chance of going on an experimental trial, but they also give the gift of their uh, of their tissues so that we can uh, biologically better understand how the drugs affect them. In addition, uh, I have to acknowledge the GU Medical Oncology Group, including JJ Gao, who helped with the uh, uh, Vista story and PDL1 story, and Xi Ping Zhao for the TGF beta story. Uh, the Checkmate 650 investigators, and then special thanks to my mentors, Jim Allison and Pam Sharma, and then Andy Futrill for the neoantigen work, uh, Brian Chapin, Neurology to help, and, and Patricia Troncosa in pathology with their help in, uh, in obtaining primary prostate tissues, and um, finally, my funding sources. Thank you. Ready for questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Sabuti.
for that outstanding presentation. And we will now move to the Q&A portion of this presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So let's take a look, um, Dr. Sabuti, at our first questions coming in. We have quite a few um, audience members and quite a few questions already um, in the box ready to be answered. So let's look at our first questions coming in. What is the role of the um, eosinophilus, uh, I apologize, neutrophilus and mast cells on tumor cells? That's a great question. So it's unclear at this point. In preclinical models, neutrophils tend to um, to enhance, or I should say neutrophils tend to be more immunosuppressive. And so targeting neutrophils is something that us and other groups are trying to consider to get rid of. Now, in regards to eosinophils and mast cells, they've been used as biomarkers, especially with drugs like cipolusal T, which is a immunotherapy vaccine, and they've been shown to be biomarkers of response, but their roles in anti-tumor immunity, it's still unclear. Thank you for that. Our next question, other than what you have shown, what do you think are the most exciting immunotherapy combinations being in prostate cancer? Yeah, so... At ASCO, uh, it was shown that the combination of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, cabozantinib, plus the immune checkpoint PD-1, or targeting PD-1, uh, led to significant clinical responses in approximately 33% of the patients. There's a lot of preclinical data showing that cabozantinib, there was a Nature paper by Ron DePina's group in 2017, showing that cabozantinib can actually deplete the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And Gary Gallick's group in a different paper showed that cabozantinib can also affect the neo uh, angiogenesis. And so cabozantinib is a TKI or trinase kinase inhibitor that affects many aspects of the tumor my, microenvironment, including the tumor cells. And then combining that with immune checkpoint therapies it, it appears to be pretty exciting. Thank you for that. And would it be, a, would you be able to, um, would vaccines offer a long-term protection against cancer? Yeah, we do believe vaccines can do that, and they have done it in a subset of patients in clinical trials. The issue is that many of the vaccines are designed to just target one tumor antigen or tumor-associated antigen, and many times the cancer cells will downregulate that protein so that the vaccine will be less effective. So we think that the successful vaccines will be ones that target multiple proteins expressed on the prostate cancer. In addition, you need vaccines that can also cause antigen spread. And then finally, we believe that new antigen vaccines may be the answer to this in the future. Thank you for that, Dr. Sabuti. And I also wanna thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. Um, the next question, is it, is it because of the nature of the bone that CDC3 cells cannot enter? Yeah, no, it's actually not that because the bone marrow is a place where a lot of T cells develop. So, or, or, so, so B cells for sure develop in the bone marrow, T cells develop in the thymus, but then they go there and, and they sort of hang out. So it's a, what we call a secondary lymphoid organ. And so the normal bone marrow is chock full of T cells, but there's something that's preventing the T cells from entering the cancer itself, whether that's neutrophils or myeloid cells or some sort of chemokine gradient, we don't know what that is at this point. Other groups have shown in other cancers that P10 deficiency can cause this, as well as the wind pathway can also cause it. So we're looking to see if that's the same in prostate cancer. 
Thank you. Our next audience member <clears throat> first says, very clear, and thank you for this interesting talk. It's a two-part question. Have you tried if RT in combination by using different schedules with these ICIs that can improve the outcomes in patients? That's the first part of the question. And by targeting other immune um, mod uh, mo modulatory agents, if not, what would you expect? Yeah, so I think radiation therapy belongs in in this uh, multidisciplinary approach that we have towards overcoming the immunosuppressive prostate tumor microenvironment. But how to do that is challenging because there's different types of radiation. There's stereotactic, there's um, standard radiation, and then there's also, so different doses are important. And you give different doses to different tissues because the bone and prostate, you can't give the same amount of dosing. And what we need more trials are is looking at how the different dosing and the different organ sites affect the immune microenvironment. For example, there's some data coming out of lung cancer that if you go with too high dose of radiation, you kill a lot of the immune cells. So a lower dose can be beneficial but we really need to dissect this out both in our preclinical models as well as in our patients before we can rationally start combining them with immunotherapies. Can you repeat the second question again, please? Absolutely. And by targeting other immune um, modulatory agents, um, and then it just says, if not, what would you expect? Yeah. We definitely want to target multiple immunomodulatory uh, agents, and it doesn't have to just be immune checkpoints. It can be cytokines or other cellular populations like regulatory T cells. The issue is when you do it concurrently, we have to watch out for toxicities. So one of the things we're doing with the Parker Institute of Cancer Immunotherapy is we're trying to do biomarker-rich trials where we're doing multiple combinations, but in sequence. And so, for example, one of the ideas that we're playing around with is maybe we start off with a vaccine to drive T cells into the cancer, and then thinking about the adaptive resistant mechanisms, then come into immune checkpoint therapy, and then understanding that myeloid cells will also be upregulated, maybe choosing a cytokine that Chuck Drake is working on, anti-IL-18, for example, to target the myeloid population. Thank you, Dr. Sabuti. And we have time for one more question. And then I just want to remind our audience members, any questions not answered today will be answered via email by Dr. Sabuti. In the bone model for prostate cancer, was self-seeding from one bone to the other a phenomenon that you had considered or were concerned about? Repeat that again, uh, self-seeding, you said? It, in the bone model of prostate cancer, it was self-seeding from one bone to the other a phenomenon oh, that yeah, you so, considered or were concerned about? Yeah. So in the mouse model of prostate cancer, we actually did not, we do not see self-seeding, but it has been described in, in patients uh, when they did um, a phylogenetic tree in a warm autopsy study, seeing where different metastases were coming from. So you can see it going from one bone metastases to another. So that, that, that phenomenon has been seen. Dr. Sabuti, thank you for your important research and your presentation today. And thank you, audience, for your outstanding questions. As a final reminder, any questions that were submitted and not answered today by our speaker, they will be addressed via email. And this presentation will be available on demand and viewed until December of 2020. So please share it with a colleague who might have missed today's exciting topic. Thank you again for your participation. And until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.